All of Breguet's workshops are found in the Valley du Joux, which is fitting because the Valley du Joux is, after all, the cradle of watchmaking and known in particular as the center for complicated watchmaking. And complications are very much part of the Breguet DNA because within its collections you'll find every significant complication in watchmaking. But if you think for a moment and you think of the name Breguet, what comes to mind first? And of course, that's tourbillons. And that's one of the things we're going to see today. We're going to go to the tourbillon workshop. And right next door to that tourbillon workshop, we're going to visit the minute repeater workshop. Now, both of these are found in the new wing of Breguet. If you visited uh, as recently as 2003 and came back today, you wouldn't recognize the manufacturer at Breguet because there have been no less than four different major expansions of workspace. Today, we're going to go into the newest wing, which is where we find the tourbillon room and right next door, the minute repeater room. Our first stop in the uh, dedicated Breguet uh, tourbillon workshop is this demonstration of the incredible range of tourbillons found in the current Breguet collection. Now step back for just a moment. Back to 1801, that's when the founder, Abraham Louis Breguet, filed his patent for the very first tourbillon in the world. Uh, and by the way, incidentally, the word tourbillon applied to this construction for watches was a word that he developed. But I have in front of me right now 11 different models. And even with Breguet's incredibly fertile imagination, I don't think that he would have conceived that someday his successors would offer this range of tourbillons. We have uh, in front of me the world's thinnest automatic winding tourbillon, the tourbillon extra flat with the peripheral winding rotor, only three millimeters in thickness for this one. Next to that is uh, something unique in the Breguet collection, a double tourbillon, but a double tourbillon with a twist because the entire dial carrying both tourbillon move with the hour hand. This is the uh, tourbillon Messador, which is the uh, mysterious tourbillon at Breguet because it uses a sapphire wheel to turn the tourbillon, which makes it appear as if the tourbillon is just floating in space. What we're going to do today is concentrate on one of the tourbillons, which is the La Tradition Tourbillon, which is the tourbillon with a fusée and chain. And we're going to look at different steps uh, in its construction. The master watchmaker has arrayed in front of him some of the key components. First of all, the uh, tourbillon cage, which is fashioned out of titanium. And uh, in fact, the shape of the arms of the cage is inspired by the original 1801 Abraham Louis Breguet patent. And next to it is the uh, balance wheel. Balance wheel also in titanium with uh, a very unusual, and this was a world first, silicium spiral with a Breguet overcoil. Behind is the upper bridge for the tourbillon that's been hand finished. If you look closely at the anglage, you'll see the sharp interior angles, which shows that it could only have been done by hand using a file, not an electric tool. Arrayed along the top is the extremely fine chain, which is used for the powering of the tourbillon because this is a fusée and chain and the chain is therefore in the powertrain for the tourbillon. 180 separate links on that extremely uh, fine and delicate chain and we have as well the movement itself. So the operation now is to take this very delicate assembly of the balance wheel with its silicium spiral and the watchmaker is now placing it inside the tourbillon cage. And here you can see already the balance wheel is, is able to turn. The screws to hold it in place are minuscule. The screwdrivers are in fact precisely calibrated to apply just the right amount of torque. 
there are different colors so that the watchmaker uses the screwdriver that is calibrated to just the right degree of tightness for the particular screw in this particular part of the movement. So now the moment has come to take the assembly of the tourbillon and the cage and to uh, move it to the uh, movement itself. Now comes the uh, top bridge for the tourbillon. And now we have the uh, tourbillon mounted into the movement, its top bridge in place. When you heard the clicking, that was the indication that the exact amount of torque, that is to say the amount of tightness that is required for that particular screw was reached. What we're going to see next is a verification of the winding of the watch. At the moment, the chain is entirely wound around the barrel of the watch, which is right next to my finger. The fusée, which is responsible for the constant force with its different diameters, is over here. Think of this like a bicycle derailleur. When the barrel is fully wound, it's in going to be in high gear. And as the barrel unwinds, it goes to successively lower gears to keep the force constant. So as you can see now, the uh, chain is going to move from the larger diameters, which is to say the low gears, when the barrel is unwound and it climbs up to the smaller diameter portion when the barrel is fully wound, which is to say the uh, high gear, just like a bicycle derailleur. Now one thing that Breguet has done to protect the very fine chain, there is a blocking mechanism that has been incorporated into the fusée to ensure that the watch is never overwound so that the owner might risk breaking the chain. It's protected when it hits the lock. In the new wing at Breguet, the watchmakers are organized by complication. We've been in the uh, tourbillon room, and right next door is the uh, minute repeater room. The watchmaker has already done a lot of work on the sound, which is to say the gongs that you see in front of him uh, have been tested already in the watch, and he's made adjustments because he wants to verify the sound for the hour, verify the sound for the minutes, and very importantly, verify the relationship between the hour sound and the minute sound so that they're harmonious with one another. And this has been a process of adjustment back and forth from his workbench into a special sound chamber that we will see later at Breguet. But right now, the job is to uh, insert the gongs into the movement and one thing you will notice is that the case of this minute repeater is in red gold and Breguet uses the same metal as the case for the gongs. So the gongs are also in red gold. If this were a white gold watch, they would both be white. Now the watchmaker has listened to the watch on the bench and what's going to happen next is the watch is going to go into that special sound chamber where the sound is going to be evaluated at a distance of 20 centimeters from the watch to be sure that the sound is exactly what the watchmaker desires. So the watchmaker comes into the anti-echo chamber and the watch is placed on a uh, holder. the sound chamber serving to allow him to listen to the watch without any distracting sounds from elsewhere. And after he's done that assessment, that evaluation, he's going to come back to the bench 
where it's time to make these small, subtle adjustments have become very important for a minute repeater to get the sound just right. Now the adjustments that the watchmaker is going to make relate to the gongs. So he's going to remove the uh, gongs uh, from the watch and do the uh, tuning. This is something that might take place multiple times during the construction of a minute repeater. The adjustments to the gongs are very, very subtle. Sometimes it's a matter of changing the length by shortening it. Other times it's a matter of a very fine filing in both cases, minuscule in dimension. Once the adjustments are done, it's going to be back into the uh, sound chamber for a further verification. So there'll be one more listen to the minute repeater, and obviously the uh, sternest test of the repeater comes at 1259, because that's 32 different chimes that all come together when you add the hours, the double chimes that come for the quarters, and then, of course, the 14 minutes. Available to us today at the uh, Breguet Minute Repeater Workshop is the watch that debuted at Basel this year, which is the Tradition Minute Repeater Tourbillon. And even though we're not able to uh, witness this watch being assembled today, it's still interesting to take a look at the watch and many of the features that it has that are found in no other minute repeater in the world. Uh, we can start, of course, with the extra flat tourbillon that you see here. But there are some other things of great interest that really relate to the minute repeater. We have the regulator, which I'm pointing to, which is a magnetic regulator, which is patented by Breguet. It is completely silent because it regulates the speed of the ding-dongs with magnetism, and no sound at all is emitted from it, and an additional advantage is that this particular regulator is more precise than any other regulator in the world. The hammers are very unusual. Uh, the minute repeater that we saw being constructed was conventional in design in that the hammers moved in a horizontal direction to the gongs that we saw on the exterior of the movement. In this case, for the new tradition minute repeater, the hammers operate vertically and strike the gongs from below, which aids transmission of the sound through the crystal glass and makes the sound louder. The gongs have an unusual shape, the gong down below, which very subtly represents a B, is the gong for the hour, and the shorter gong is the gong for the minute. Est-ce que je peux tourner la, la montre moi-même? Now that we look at the backside, there are some unusual features uh, as well. Every minute repeater has to have a barrel, of course, to supply power for the chiming of the watch. And we can see the barrel for the minute repeater here. And if you look closely, coming from the barrel is something you're not going to see in any other minute repeater on the market, which is a chain. And this watch has a chain drive to take the power from the minute repeater barrel and deliver it to the minute repeater mechanism. And it's constructed in such a way, like the tourbillon that we saw earlier, to deliver constant force to the repeater so that the sounding will remain constant and even in volume and, of course, with the regulator in pace through a long sounding such as the one of uh, 1259. And finally, from the back side of the watch, we can see the back side of the mechanism uh, for actuation of the gongs. What we see in this part are the components that are used for reading the time so that the minute repeater will sound the time uh, correctly as it's shown on the watch. As we come downstairs from our visit for the special workshop for the tourbillon and the special workshop for the minute repeater next door, and pausing uh, next to the image of the minute repeater that we saw under construction and uh, testing. 
there's a thought that lingers. And that is that we have too much of a tendency sometimes to focus on features of a watch. Does it have a terminal? Does it have a fusée and chain? All of which are important, of course, but we tend to forget the other element that we really saw at work uh, upstairs. And that is the respect for tradition, the finesse with which these watches are constructed, and the way in which there's a marriage between the methods of 200 years ago and all of that learning with some modern technology to make them even better. Thank you.